Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today we're doing a jump back in history to the end of the First World War. We have three very special guests who will make us understand and will debate about one of the most important speeches ever given by a U.S. president, the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson. Let me first introduce Mr. Cardona. <laughs> Mr. Lewis. I'm sorry to go. All right. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered World War I in the side of the Allies. Nonetheless, their objectives weren't the same as the European nations who were fighting over territory, strengthening their nation states or in revenge of past wars. The objective of the US, which was dictated by Wilson, the 28th president of the United States, was to enter World the War and to bring out lasting peace for the world. With this objective, he gathered together a number of advisors and had them put together a plan for peace. Those were the famous 14 points. What were the purpose of the points? So they were to outline a strategy for ending the war and in a way impose some of the American values. The US wasn't going to fight for anything risking their soldiers' lives in vain. They wanted to establish in a clear way what they were fighting for. Woodrow Wilson, through a speech, and his 14 points became the first and only leader fighting in World War I to publicly outline his war goals. Now, Mr. Cardona is going to introduce what were the five first points. All right. All right. Thank you very much, um, Speaker uh, President of the Republic. Um, as you very well explained, the 14 points were created by Wilson to ensure peace. And well, we all know how that ends. The first five points talk about establishing a common ground on how the relations between each country should be carried out. Different states um, should work together to guarantee peace. I will summarize those five first points in my own words, if you don't mind, and I will analyze both countries' reaction to these points and the impact they created in order to achieve the goal created by Wilson, which was to ensure peace. The first point is about no more secret diplomacy. Secret diplomacy was a rule before, during, and before World First World War. As an example of this, we have the Turtle Alliance formed in 1882, which between Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary, which we all know it was one side of the, of the com combatants. When Italy switched sides and signed the Treaty of London in 1915, it was also performing secrecy. Another secret treaty was signed, was signed by the Allies with Russia, promising them to control Constantinople and the Dardanelles. Wilson realized the problem of secret diplomacy. They had the own trust between different partners and unfair land distributions. Despite Wilson's pretension, this point would never be achieved, and secret diplomacy would keep being the rule in the period between wars and during World War II. As an example of this, we could cite the Rapallo Treaty between Germany and Russia, where military cooperation was established between both countries. The second point is really interesting because it established freedom of navigation throughout, the, the, throughout all the seas. The beginning of this issue lies in the 1908 Declaration of London on the conduct of naval warfare. That was seen by all powers and all countries, but it was never ratified and it was neither respected in the First World War. This benefited the Allies and was a key element of the defeat of Germany through the, nav the naval blockade. This point would be not included in the Versailles Treaty for a variety of reasons, but being the most important that Britain would never, was never willing to lose its hegemony on the sea. The third point would be related to free trade and equal trade conditions. This point was related to freedom of seas as well and it could be related as well to the attacks of the U-boats to merchant U.S. ships. This point was neither accomplished, and we can see how unfair economic issues established, the established by the Versailles Treaty would lay the roots of the Second World War. We can also see, on the other hand, how free trade have been a key issue to ensure peace during more than 60 years in Europe. All right. So the fourth point would be, could be summarized with less arms and armies. Wilson believed that the war escalated that quickly through Europe because countries had their armies already. Therefore, according to Wilson, future, future conflicts would be avoided if state would not have armies prepared to go to war. This point would be imposed to Germany in the Versailles Treaty, but wasn't accomplished by no part. In part, again, because of the continuum of secret diplomacy and the ability of Germany to perform military trainings in Russia, again, to the Europa, due to the Europa Treaty. The fifth point would be self-determination, within the base of all the 14 points. Self-determination has the goal of dismantled European empires and create new states based on a culture and national identity. 
According to Wilson, these new organizations would be more democratic, but also would undermine European power in front of the US. The next Territorium points that Jan will explain would be based on this concept of self-determination. Thank you so much, Mr. Stemper, for having me here. Pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Cardona, also, for this tremendous and incredible analysis of the four uh, main points. Thank you. Uh, next eight points were aimed at uh, resolving specific territorial disputes uh, between those countries that were involved in, in combat in order to, as Wilson was dreaming, to put an end to this World War I uh, carnage. So, um, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, which was signed then in uh, 1919, was uh, influenced by those 14 points, even if uh, the Allies were much more focused on, uh, I don't know if you agree on that, on punishing Germany, instead of looking for a kind of perpetual peace, which Kant would have said. Uh, so, I would start with France and, uh, and Italy. So, France was granted those stolen, as they say, territories of Alsace and Lorraine, and they uh, were granted also some territories in the, in the run, as, this territory, as these territories were demilitarized because they were part of, of Germany before the, the war. Uh, regarding Italy, uh, they were promised some lands uh, according to what, as Wilson would uh, have said, clearly recognizable lines of nationality in order to secure its borders. Also, talking about uh, Poland, the new independent Poland, to the Baltic, sorry, to the Baltic Sea, thanks to a corridor that divided Germany in two sides. Belgium, as it was uh, conquered by Germany at the beginning of World War I, was also evacuated and restored. Second, and this is the key point, of, as Mr. Cardona said, we will talk about the principle of self-determination. This is a key point, and this is, uh, in a way, how do we remember Wilson 14 points. The principle of, uh, the principle of self-determination is based on a simple uh, idea. The idea that nations should have the right to govern themselves without interference of, na of other countries. So this principle affected Russia and Austria-Hungary because they were those states that gathered the most different uh, national minorities within its borders. So um, a lot of new states were created since, the, uh, since Wilson's uh, speech. And finally, which are, this is the point which I found the, the most interesting one, talking about if those uh, eight points actually worked as it was expected or not. What do you think about it? I would say that it did not work as expected. It's complicated to say. So actually we could say that 14, uh, Wilson's 14 points were totally ineffective in solving the territorial uh, disputes. Italy, for example, was granted new territories, but actually uh, it did not recover any of these lands that was promised, and, and so that benefited this idea of the uh, mutilated victory, which was uh, a term coined by an Italian poet called uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, who was very nationalistic and promoted fascism then in, in Italy. Talking about Germany also, they were just seen as guilty for World War I, and this is uh, something that uh, John Maynard Keynes, in his book The Economic Consequences of the Peace, he just mentioned it, that and said that it would be a mess and a completely, uh, it would be completely wrong to just uh, punish only Germany and that the Allies should look for a much more um, equal treatment with Germany, even if uh, he had, they had lost the, the war. So, um, as I said, Germany uh, was seen as guilty for World War I's uh, outbreak and longevity, and so this uh, appeared to be termed and coined as the German diktat, and that uh, this and the loss of lots of territories uh, favored people's acceptance for Nazis' uh, ideology and ideas. And, as everyone knows, then comes Hitler, etc, etc, etc. Thank you very much for your critical opinion, very interesting. So, last but not least, Mr. Arrigo is going to present the last 14 points for that. You might say that bef because I have only one point that I'm a lazy guy. However, this is not true because the last point of Wilson was the one, most important point out there. And it goes like this. A general association of nations must be formed under a specific covenant for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. The last point of Wilson, number 14, was one of the most visionary points of the list. It was planned to create a multilateral international association to solve international disputes or conflicts with the use of diplomacy, like we have been studying, right? Right. Furthermore, this is when in January 10, 1920, an important date in the calendar, the League of Nations is created with the main goal 
of protecting the members from other atrocities to happen. Right after the world saw with the First World War, which was a disaster. However, the League never seemed to work to its full potential, and there were many reasons for it. In 1946, another important day in history, just after the Second World War and without accomplishing its main goal, the League was dismantled. It happened. Things get dismantled lately. Yeah. One of the most important reasons was the fact that many countries, many countries, I repeat, never joined the supranational institutions. One of them, and the most important one, was the United States. Wilson's idea was never forged out due to the fact that its country was never, due to the fact that Wilson was never able to change the Senate's opinion on the league. The 14th point was voted twice on the Senate. You know that a point has to be voted on the Senate in the United States to be passed. It was voted twice, it never happened. And this is due because the Americans believed that the Europe problems was for European thing, for the Europeans. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to be honest, right? I mean, yeah. Furthermore, Germany and Russia were denied entrance to the league on the one hand. The Treaty of Versailles blamed the war on them and settled this with a sanction of not being able to join any international organizations. Okay. It's quite complicated to understand. No, it's not. Definitely it's not. Because on the other hand, the West was afraid of having a communist government. And it is still afraid of having a communist the government in the league due to the fear of a domino effect. In conclusion, the League of Nations was a mere dream as three of the most recognized and powerful nations of the world never formed part. This left the organization very weak. And if we want to add on to this and complete this sequence, we need to understand that Germany was never, I, the League, never mind, the League was never able to have an own proper army, which resulted in complications on how to solve conflict. The only ways they could sanction actors was through economic sanctions involving a so-called army that they never had, and diplomacy to discuss conflicts between countries involved. Despite dismantling of the League of Nations, it was able to give somewhat of a path for humanity in the creation of a strong international organization. It gave the pillars to work and create what is now known as the United Nations. Thank you very much, Paul, for having us here. It was a pleasure to be here. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, all my future guests. It was a pleasure. And we'll see each other next week.